I am celebrating five years of being in business with Recloseted, and over the past half a decade, I have made my fair share of mistakes. I have learned a lot of lessons and to celebrate, I wanted to package everything into this video. I am specifically going to be sharing 50 lessons in this video. It's gonna be jam packed and we're going to cover how to start a business, sales, how to get customers, marketing, finances, hiring, mindset, and literally anything and everything in between. I really hope that you watch until the end because there's gonna be a lot of strategies and tips in here and I really think it would be beneficial to you. And for folks that stay until the end, there will be a special exclusive gift for you. So without any further ado, let's dive in. The first category of lessons that I wanted to talk about is around how to start a business and how to start a brand. The first lesson is that progress is better than perfection. This is something I learned the hard way as a recovering perfectionist. And if you identify as that too, then maybe this will be helpful for you. But I'm gonna tell you, your first few social media posts or even your first few iterations of your product, you're gonna look back and you're going to hate it. And so instead of trying to tweak it and perfect it and spend hours and hours, if not days and days on these things, I would get it to about 85% done or 85% perfect, put it out there, collect feedback, get the data so that you can learn and you can improve. Because if you never put something out there, you cannot grow. And at the end of the day, growth and progress is more important than getting something quote unquote perfect because your definition of perfect may be different from mine. And so at the end of the day, there is so much stuff that goes into building a business and a brand from the ground up. Likely don't have to tell you that. So make progress and strive to get things done versus get things perfect because that's subjective anyways. So progress over perfection. The next lesson is that it is overwhelming and that is okay. You are building something from the ground up. You are starting from zero and there is a lot to do. So expect that it's going to be stressful. Expect that it's going to be overwhelming. And if you go into it with that expectation and with that reassurance that it's normal, it can make you feel a bit better. But also to manage that overwhelm and stress, I think it's really important to list out everything you need to do. And a lot of the times, part of the overwhelm and stress comes from the fact that you don't even know what you need to do and you feel like you're missing things. And so if you want to start a sustainable fashion brand, I have a free checklist that goes from idea all the way to successful 20K launch with every single thing you need to do. And I'm gonna walk you through the first portion of it so that you have my support. So if you want that checklist, you can snag it at recloseted.com slash masterclass. The checklist comes along with amazing lessons. So the link will be in the description box. It'll be there for you. But essentially to combat the overwhelm and the stress, you really need to make a list of all the tasks you need to do, assign dates to it, and as you start chipping away, you're going to look up and realize all the progress that you have made. So instead of being overwhelmed and freaking out, just start listing everything out, start tackling it, and I promise you, like even a month later, you're going to look up and realize all the progress you have made because you're also not trying to be a perfectionist. The next category I wanted to address is finances. Now finances and money is something that people stress about, especially as first time entrepreneurs. So my first lesson is that you want to try to rely on self funding or funding from yourself as much as possible, because then you don't have pressure from banks. You don't have to worry about interest rates rising, but also you're not owing money to your loved ones or your friends and family. It's really on you and you can self fund your business or your brand by working a nine to five job or doing contract gigs. And I think that that's a really good way to start. And then for clients that launch fashion brands, I always recommend they also do pre-sales to supplement it. So it's not just self-funding, but it is important to be able to rely on yourself and know at the end of the day that you are making income for yourself, but also for your business. So I highly recommend doing self-funding. And then the lesson after that is if you are working a nine to five job or a contract gig in order to pay for yourself and you know your living expenses, but also for your business, then you need to set boundaries because if your nine to five job is really an eight to eight job and you're working 12 hours a day, that doesn't leave a lot of time to work on your business. So you need to set really firm boundaries. And when you're at work, you're gonna work on work, but then if you decide you're gonna work on your brand or your business after work, then block that off and know that that is your secret time for your business. 
And a mindset shift that was really helpful for me is thinking about your nine to five job as your side hustle and think of your business and your brand as your main job. So then mentally you have your priorities straight. And if you know that your business is your main source of income or your main nine to five, if you will, then you're going to prioritize that even just subconsciously. So make sure you do that, set those boundaries and just really prioritize your brand because nothing is more important than spending time and carving out that time for your dreams and for your business. Another financial lesson I learned is that you need to keep on top of your finances. This may go without saying, but you need to know how much money you're making, how much you're spending, and then how much you have left over. And QuickBooks is a really great accounting tool that can help you do that. We'll have a link for you down below. I believe our link will give you 50% off for six months. But essentially you want to make sure you keep track of that because come tax season, you don't want to be scrambling. And another lesson is just setting aside taxes as well so that at the end of the year, when the government comes knocking and asks for an amount of money, you're not blindsided and you don't have to scramble to try to come up with it. So I always just recommend having the taxes set aside. And then of course you want to work with an accountant just to make sure everything is set up from the get go. You never want any surprises when it comes to your finances. So please set up the infrastructure and everything so that you are aware of how much money you're making, how much you're spending, and then how much you have left at the end of the day. So please, please, please do that. That is so important. You cannot stick your head in the sand when it comes to your numbers and to your finances. The next category I wanted to talk about is mindset. Mindset is so important as an entrepreneur because you can have the best strategies, but if you have limiting beliefs or you are subconsciously or consciously telling yourself stories that is preventing you from executing those strategies and moving forward, then that is going to self-sabotage your success and we don't want that. That's what happened to me in the first few years of my business a lot of the time, so that's why mindset is so important. And the first lesson I wanna talk about is setting expectations. Starting your own business, especially if this is your first time doing it, is going to be hard. It is going to be difficult, it is going to be challenging, but you as a person are gonna grow so much. You're gonna learn so much, but also you're going to have to level up and become the person that can be a successful entrepreneur, which in my opinion is really exciting. But as you're going through it, it does feel icky, it does feel stressful, it feels overwhelming, but every single person feels that way. And I wish I knew that earlier because a lot of the times you can trick yourself into thinking that it's just you going through this or you're the only one with the problem, but every single person finds it challenging. You just need to set your expectations and if you go into it knowing it's going to be hard, when it does go hard, you can just be like, okay, I expected this and you can keep going. So set the right expectations, that's really important. The next lesson is that you need to face your limiting beliefs. Limiting beliefs are what it sounds like. They are beliefs that you have that limit you and hold you back. And there's a book that I love that really helped me with this. It's actually here. And it's called The Mountain Is You. This is an amazing book, this is not sponsored, but in this book, Brianna really talks about self-sabotage and how to push past your upper limits. So I highly recommend you read it because at the end of the day, if you don't address this stuff, it's really going to help keep you stuck. And that's not what we want. We want you to push past that and achieve all the level of success that you deserve. And the last lesson under the mindset section is that you need to believe that you are worthy of success. This is something that may sound a bit wishy-washy because it's like, yeah, everyone's deserving of success, but until you personally believe it, you may subconsciously not want to execute certain strategies or not do things that you need to be doing or procrastinate or, you know, be a perfectionist instead of doing progress because subconsciously you're trying to self-sabotage yourself. And so it's really important to know that you deserve a career you are passionate about. You deserve to consciously create wealth for yourself and you deserve to love what you're doing. So make sure you work through any of the mindset items. The Mountain Is You is an amazing book. You can check out other resources as well, but it's important you work on this because if you don't, you are going to be the bottleneck of your own business and you're going to stand in the way of your own success, which we don't want. Next, let's talk about burnout. Burnout is something I faced a lot of early on when I was starting Recloseted because I side hustled Recloseted, meaning I worked another nine to five job while I was building it. And that meant I was essentially working two full-time jobs, which is a lot. 
And so one of the first lessons I learned the hard way is that you either rest on your own time or your body is going to force you to rest. Because at the end of the day, your body needs what it needs and if you're not giving it to it, it's going to shut you down and then just take what it needs to. And in my opinion, it's better to kind of decide when you rest versus having to be forced into it. The first few times you burn out, I think you should really give yourself grace and compassion because you don't really know where the limit is. And also the first time you burn out, you may not actually know what it feels like. And so for me personally, burnout feels like I need to sleep a lot, I'm very unmotivated, things that used to excite me don't excite me anymore and I also just get really foggy and I start to forget things and so those are just signs of what burnout looks like in me. For you it may look different but I think it's really important to really be able to start to identify where your limits are, what are some warning signs that may indicate that burnout is coming so that you can be more preventative versus reactive. If you are burnt out or if you're burning out, I think it's really important to figure out how you can recharge. If you think of yourself as a battery and work kind of depletes some of that battery, how can you charge yourself back up? And it doesn't have to be a week-long vacation or it doesn't have to be a spa day. You can recharge for free. For me personally, this looks like getting enough sleep. This looks like taking walks outside, being in nature, hydrating with water, like it can be as simple as that. It doesn't have to be a super elaborate staycation or anything like that, but figure out what charges your battery and implement those every single day. I used to give this analogy, if, you know, if you're an instant pot, every single day you wanna let off a little bit of steam, but you, know, you don't wanna wait until the end, have it all bubble up and then have your instant pot like explode. I'm sure all of us have had that happen to us before, but you're kind of the same. We wanna let off a little bit of steam every single day or we wanna charge ourselves every single day so that we don't break down. Because remember, you either rest or your body will force you to. And then moving forward, you eventually want to be more proactive versus reactive. So what I mean by that is really get ahead of the burnout the first few times, again, like give yourself grace and compassion because you may not know it's coming, you may not know what it feels like, but after a few times, I think it's really important to take your health into your own hands and really start to ask yourself every single morning or every single evening, how overwhelmed you feel on a scale of one to 10. And if you know you're getting into that seven or eight range, start implementing some of those things that recharge your battery so that you can prevent yourself from going off the cliff and completely burning out. The next category I wanted to address is around hiring. Hiring is important because if you want to grow and scale your business, you need to bring in help. And I know sometimes you can feel like your business is your baby and no one else can do as good of a job as you can, but you need to learn to relinquish control and entrust others. But that comes with learning and you need to hire the right people. So as such, here are my hiring lessons. First of all, you don't have to hire full-time employees right off the get-go, and in fact, I recommend against that because it adds a lot of stress to you and to your business. If you can't make payroll, that can be really stressful, and so at the beginning, you can have part-time contractors come in and help you with certain things, and as they are busier and as you grow and scale your business and you can afford to, you can transition them to full-time employees. I would not start with full-time employees from the get-go. I would work yourself up to that. And when it comes to hiring, it is really important to figure out your company values. And I don't mean values in the sense that you're going to pick these words that kind of resonate with you or just stick them up on the wall and like never look at them again. These are things that you live, you breathe, and you truly embody. And this is important because it will help you attract the right type of person. And instead of saying, you know, every single day we clock in at eight o'clock or things always come in on time or, you know, X, Y, Z, if you have a value that's we are timely or something, or we really care about the work we do, then that will fall into that and you don't have to be so prescriptive. That is something I learned, a mentor taught me that, as I am someone that is very OCD and I really like to control things, but if you have, you know, if you zoom out and you have the ability to have these overcompassing values or these pillars of your business, it can help you attract the right type of people. And to help you figure out what you should be outsourcing and what type of role you want to hire for, if you're ready for that part-time contractor to come in and help you, there's an exercise that you can do. What you're going to do is write down a comprehensive list of every single thing you do in your business 
And then after you have that list, you're going to categorize everything into four categories. So the first category is going to be things you genuinely enjoy doing and you're also good at. The next category is going to be tasks that you genuinely enjoy doing, but you're bad at it. And then there's going to be the category of things that you really despise doing, you really hate it, but you're good at it. And then the last category is going to be things you despise doing, but you're also bad at. After completing that exercise, you want to outsource or get rid of the tasks that you are not good at and you don't like doing. That is right off the bat what you should be doing. And then after that, you can take a look at the tasks that you don't like to do, but you're good at them, and or look at the tasks that you like doing, but you're not good at. And for anything that is not imperative to the business, like I would not outsource sales and or marketing strategy at this point. I think it's still important for you to be doing that. But if it's like bookkeeping or something along those lines that you just despise doing, you're not good at it, then you can definitely outsource that. But you want to make sure you use your common sense, use your judgment to figure out what you should be outsourcing. And this activity can really help you do that. Once you have that list, you can then turn it into a job description. And maybe it's actually two different job descriptions you're looking for. But if you have a bunch of marketing related executional items, then maybe you're looking for a marketing assistant. Or if you have a lot of you know, accounting and finance executional items, then maybe you're looking a finance assistant, right? Really think about how you can group these tasks together and create some sort of job description. Then you want to do a posting, you can put it on your website. I often recommend doing a form instead of having people fill in a cover letter because at the end of the day, you don't really want to be reading 50 cover letters. You might want to ask pointed questions instead about why you know, sustainable fashion is important to them or what their values are or what have you so that you can really filter through and see who the best candidate would be. And then after that, of course, you want to interview them and do all that stuff. So I would definitely recommend doing that exercise and then creating job descriptions from that and hiring and looking accordingly. The next set of lessons is around team and leadership because we've talked about hiring and now once you've hired the right person, you need to be able to manage them. And this is something they don't really teach you at school or things like that. This it does come with experience. And so the first thing is you need to onboard them and set them up for success. Whenever a new person joins, you need to let them know what's expected of them, what does good look like, and just really ensure that they are equipped with everything they need to be successful. The next thing is the importance of culture. And I learned this the hard way. I found an amazing person that was really skilled, but they, at the end of the day, weren't living by our recloseted values. But I kept them because I was like, they're so great, they're just kind of not you know, vibing with the rest of the team, their attitude isn't great. And at the end of the day, those types of players or those types of team members, when you bring them in, they affect everyone else. And so by keeping people that disrupt the culture or keeping people that perhaps aren't meeting deadlines or are slacking off, you actually affect the rest of the team. And so it's actually better for you to cut your losses and let them go because you don't want your star players or your A players to feel like, you know, there's this person getting away with murder pretty much here and they're still here, so why would I try? Right, you don't want to discourage your A players. You always want to protect them. So. You know, live by your cultures, hire people that are aligned with your values. That's why it's really important to identify those values. And if someone's not a right fit, then just cut them loose. I think it's really important to have those difficult decisions and have those hard conversations because you don't want to affect the rest of the team and have an adverse reaction on your business. To go with that though, communication is really important. So I mentioned onboarding people, telling them what's expected of them, but you also need to give feedback. Early on in my entrepreneurial career, I would be so afraid of giving people feedback because I wanted to make sure that people liked me and that was a whole other thing. But as a manager and as a leader, you need to give people feedback, tell them what you like, what you don't like and have them improve because at the end of the day, if they're not improving, they're not growing, they're not learning anyways too. So it's really important to communicate with them and give them feedback. And for people that you feel like are not living by your company's values or they may not be a good fit, it's important to communicate that too so that they can try to shift or adjust or maybe they'll just tell you it's not a fit for them either. So communicate, that is so important. 
don't shy away from difficult conversations because they are very, very important and most likely it's going to come back and bite you in the butt later. So it's important to have those difficult conversations because it will make your life easier in the long run. The other lesson when it comes to team or managing people is to really take them under your wing and nurture them and grow them. I find that when people are growing in their career and they're learning, they're much happier and also you can take on some of that mentorship role. Whenever someone joins our team, I always try to figure out what their career aspirations are, what they're interested in, what they want to learn about, and I try to groom them and nurture them as much as possible. Yes, there's a possibility they leave, but honestly, I think that when someone loves what they're doing and they're learning, they will give back to the business tenfold. So always take people's learning and development really seriously and mentor people. I think it's really, really important and it's, it's the sign of a good manager. And this is something that is definitely not really taught in school. You kind of have to learn through experience, but act like how you would want a manager to treat you essentially, right? Like make sure you nurture people, take them under your wing. They are helping you build your baby or helping you build your business. So make sure that they are happy there and they feel fulfilled, just as fulfilled as you do. So make sure you mentor people, take them under your wing and really nurture them and help them with their learning and their development. The next category of lessons is under branding. And branding is something that is really important because it helps differentiate your brand from competitors, but also helps your customers recognize that this is you and your business. And the first thing I always get our clients to do is to create a differentiated product that solves a problem. If you do have a product that works, eventually people will try to jump on the bandwagon either by imitating it and or copying it. So your brand is what's going to differentiate you from the rest. So it's really important you take it seriously. And I'm not saying that you need to spend thousands and thousands of dollars on a brand. And so the thing to really think about is what do you want to be known for? What do you want your business to be known for? And after you have set that, really embody it and live in those values because it's really important if, let's say for us at Recloseted, like we walk the walk, we only work with clients that genuinely want to make the fashion industry a better place. So we don't work with people that don't do that. And so we embody that and that's very important to us. And so for you and your brand, maybe you don't want to work with plastic. And so that's something that your brand is embodying. Like really think about what those values are and what your brand stands for so that when you need to make decisions, it's easy and it will also be quote unquote on brand for you. The other lesson is that branding works exponentially. So both good or bad, there's a lot of word of mouth that happens. And so when someone talks about your business or your brand, what do you want them to say? And at the end of the day, you want it to be hopefully good. And so just remember that, like remember that people talk, people you know, do word of mouth, and that's going to be exponential versus you trying to sell one-on-one -on -one to people or even running ads or things like that. So your brand is very important and you want to make sure you are continuously embodying the values that you want so that you are, presenting the brand and the business that you want to in the world. And now that we've discussed branding, let's move on to some marketing lessons. When it comes to marketing, you always want to know and remember that progress is better than perfection. I talked about that already at the beginning of this video, but also remember that practice makes perfect. And your first few pieces of content, you are going to look back and hate and be like, oh my God, this is so bad. And that's okay, that's normal. You're gonna continuously get better. Remember, if you don't put things out there, you don't know what works, what doesn't, you can't get feedback. And so just get into the groove of creating content, put things out there, because remember that with practice, you will get better. And the other marketing lesson I learned is that content is a lot of work, which is why you really want to focus and double down on your efforts. Before, when I was side hustling with Closeted, I didn't have a lot of time and I didn't have a lot of energy and I didn't have a lot of resources. So it made sense for us to double down on one platform, which is really our podcast. And I also did Instagram too, but honestly, our podcast is where we were consistent. 
Recloseted Radio, if you don't know, we have an amazing podcast, so a quick plug there. But we focused on the podcast because I felt like that long form piece of content was really helpful for people. And there weren't a lot of people talking about sustainable fashion on that space or on that platform. So that's what we focused on. And then now that we've grown and scaled, we're now on YouTube, we're doing heavily on Instagram and emails and things like that too. But as you're starting out, just pick one platform to be on. And I would highly recommend you do email marketing as well. I've talked about it on this channel before, but it's important that you own your customer data and you're not at the beck and call of algorithms. So I would recommend one social media platform or just one platform in general and couple that with email marketing. And the reason why I want you to focus is because in order for someone to follow you, they need to make sure that your platform is giving them value and you need to make sure you're putting out quality content which takes time. And so if you're on every platform under the sun, you're probably not doing them very well and probably not doing them well enough to be able to take off and have a bunch of people follow you or support you. So put your eggs in one basket, make sure your customer is there, of course, and focus so that you can really grow a community that will support you, that will buy from you, and then as you grow in skill, you can expand. The other thing when it comes to content is to try to repurpose as much as you can. Before, when we were just doing podcasts, I would take the podcast, turn it into blog posts, turn the blog posts into email, turn the emails into Instagram captions. Like we would really try to slice and dice and make the content go as far as possible. And I highly recommend that for you as well because you're going to spend a lot of time on your content. So you want to make sure as many people see it as possible and you want to make sure that content piece is not just going to be shown once and then never see the light of day again. We want to make sure it has a long shelf life. And another lesson is that when it comes to your marketing strategy, you want to give as much value as possible because when you give people value, they feel inclined to follow you and support you because they're actually getting something out of it. And when you give people value, be it educational, like you teach them something or you're helping them with a problem, then they'll actually develop that connection with you and with your brand. And that's what we want. We don't want you just to be pushing your products on Instagram all the time and being spammy because that's not really going to take off and people may unfollow you or not even follow you to begin with. So it's really important to give value and think about what your ideal customer is struggling with, what pain points they have and how you can help them solve it. And at the end of the day, that takes a lot of time and effort, which is why I recommend when you're first starting to just pick one platform and maybe do email marketing so that you can actually do a good job and grow your community. The next lessons are about sales. And sales is important because it is the livelihood of your business. If your business is not making revenue, then you don't really have a business, you have a hobby. And I definitely learned this the hard way. So sales, there's a lot of lessons in here. Might be common sense, but you obviously need to sell something to make sales. And that again is common sense, but if you don't have something that people know you're selling or you don't have something that people want, then you're not going to make money. And so it's really important to always have something you're selling. And there were periods of my business where I felt like I needed to perfect the back end, and so I wasn't selling anything. And I obviously didn't make money and that was really stressful. And honestly, there's no perfect way to scale. So instead of trying to perfect everything and then go out and sell something, because remember, progress over perfection, it is important to have something to sell so that you at least have money. And then you can always hire people to help you do the back end, help you figure things out. But it is really important to always have something to sell. And the next lesson is that sales is not sleazy. If you do it in a way where it's aligned with your values and you're actually genuinely trying to help your ideal customer with your products, then you should feel good about selling it and telling them about it. This is why for our clients, I always tell them that you need to figure out who your target customer or who your ideal customer is, figure out what their problem and pain points are and create a solution that addresses those problems and pain points. Because in that manner, you know that you are genuinely helping them. They need your products and that will help you sell because they're going to want it. They're going to see the value in it, which makes your job as a salesperson so much easier. But on top of that, you know that it's actually going to help them and that will really help you feel like you're not being sleazy. The next lesson is that sales is a skill, which means that you will get better over time. If you've never sold before, then it is okay. You are going to suck your first few times. I definitely suck my first few times too, but you gotta put in the reps. And again, it's about having the right expectations. So know that it's going to suck, know that you're going to suck, 
but with practice and with progress and putting in the reps, you will get better. And when it comes to sales too, a lot of people talk about closing, making the sale, but at the end of the day, the goal is really for your prospect or the person you're talking to to make a decision. They're either going to buy or they're not going to buy, but your role is to help them decide. And about 10% of people were never gonna buy to begin with, and the other 10% of people were probably gonna buy even if you weren't there. So the sales game is that 80% of people that are on the fence, and so know that some people weren't gonna buy it in the beginning, and that's fine, you just need to help them make that decision. And if you look at sales that way, it can really help alleviate some of the pressure and also help not make it sleazy because you're coming at it from a place of genuinely wanting to help people with your product, but also help them make a decision. And the last lesson when it comes to sales, so if what you're asking them to pay is lower than what they think they're going to get out of it or the value, then you're likely going to make the sale. So if someone says something is too expensive or they don't want to pay for it, that means that you either have not included enough value in your product and or you have not expressed that value. So if you are in a period right now where you're not making sales, then I would go back to the drawing board and really figure out, is it the product? Do you need to make it better? Do you need to solve more pain points? Do you need to talk to your customer more? And or do you need to work on your sales skills and really talk up the product? Because if you go back to my original point around sales, like if you don't have something you're selling, you're obviously not making sales. But then also, if you feel like sales is sleazy or you feel some type of way about it and you have limiting beliefs around it, you're probably not going to wholeheartedly sell it and they probably pick up on it. And so really make sure you are expressing how valuable what you're offering is and that will really help you. The next category I wanted to talk about is competitors. The first lesson is that if there's an opportunity, people will flock to it. So it is actually a good sign if what you're doing has other people interested. So don't let that deter you. It's actually a bit of a red flag if no one wants to do what you're doing. So likely there will be other fashion brands or other competitors in your niche or your space and that is okay. The next lesson is you need to focus on your business and stay in your lane. I think it's important to know what's going on and what your competitors are offering, but you should not be looking at your competitors' Instagrams or websites for hours and hours every single day. That is not healthy, and instead, you should be focused on your ideal customer and obsess over them instead and how you can best serve them. And I know that's easier said than done, but you really just need to realize everyone's going to bring their own mark onto the world, everyone's going to run their business differently, everyone's going to want to do different things. So it's good that you have competitors because that means there's a good opportunity there and you will come into the space and do what you want to do in order to make it work. So focus on your business. And the last lesson here is just don't compare. I know that's easier said than done, but like I mentioned, you will bring your own perspective, you will bring your own knowledge you will bring your own magic and so know that you will do the best of your abilities and a lot of the times we like to compare our like point zero to someone else's point 100 and that's not fair because they may have already gone through a lot of things they may have more time than you do they may have more team members they may have more resources so comparison is really the thief of joy and it's not the best use of your time I know it's easier said than done, but really try to focus on you, your business, and your ideal customer as much as possible. And the next category I wanted to discuss was around sustainability. So this is something that obviously I'm passionate about, but as I work more in the field, I really realized that sustainability doesn't really exist. Instead, it's all about a balancing act because if we truly wanted to be sustainable, we wouldn't really start businesses, we wouldn't start fashion lines, we would just sit at home alone in the dark, not wearing any clothes, not eating or not doing anything because we don't want to have an impact on the world. Instead, I think sustainability is really about how you can live on this earth, do your thing, but do it in moderation and think about future generations and balance it as much as possible. So instead of trying to be perfect when it comes to your sustainability, just accept that it's a balancing act and you can just do the best you can given your time, your resources, and your energy and be okay with that. The other thing I learned about sustainability is that it is not black and white. There's a lot of gray. So for example, with even dead stock materials, which upon first glance looks great, which you know, if you don't know what dead stock is, essentially it's fabric that's left over that smaller brands sometimes can buy 
But a lot of people argue that dead stock isn't good because it encourages bigger brands and bigger mills to overproduce. There's a reason why bigger brands haven't used it because maybe something's wrong with the fabric or it's not high quality. And so there's pros and cons to everything. There's not one thing that is perfectly good or perfectly sustainable. And there's not one thing that is perfectly bad or perfectly unsustainable. Sustainability is great, it's nuanced, like many things in this world. So instead of trying to label something as sustainable or unsustainable or good and bad, I think it's important to have an open mind and figure out what the values are for your business and decide accordingly. And speaking of values for your business, I also think it's really important to pick and choose your battles when it comes to sustainability and pick sustainability priorities. That is something I always get our clients to do because as a brand that's just starting out, you have limited time, limited resources, and limited budget. So you need to figure out what's important to you and to your brand, what do you value, and then you can act accordingly. Because otherwise you get faced with decision paralysis and you don't know what to do because this is technically unsustainable or that's technically unsustainable. So if you tell me that eliminating carbon emissions and really trying to do that is the most important to you, then you may want to look at materials locally, or you may want to look at manufacturers locally, or you want to think about your shipping differently. But if you say everything under the sun is important, that's going to be really debilitating and you're not going to be able to make any progress. So pick and choose your battles, pick and choose your priorities because that is really important. And the next category of lessons is under learning and development. Your learning and development is so important because you do not want to be the bottleneck of your business. If you don't grow and up-level your skills, you will not be able to take your business to that next level. So it is very important you continuously grow and develop and learn. Another lesson I learned is that you need mentors for every part of your business. You cannot have a mentor for your personal life, for your, let's say, workout, for your mental health, for your finances, for your business strategy, for your marketing. It is really, really hard to find a unicorn like that. So instead, if you feel like you're really struggling in sales right now, then seek out someone that is really good at sales and seek out someone that you can learn from them. Or alternatively, if you're really struggling with your mental health or you're going through something, seek out a therapist or a counselor because that's what they specialize in. And don't go to your barber or your hairstylist because they're kind of a armchair expert, right? So really try to find people that are specialized and find mentors that have proven results and or help people get those results that you want. And don't try to rely on one person to teach you about everything because that's just not realistic. Another lesson I learned is that there's seasons of learning and then there's seasons of implementing. It is important that you intake information, that you learn and you grow. However, if you don't take the time to implement it, that is useless. So sometimes you are going through seasons where you're going through books, you're going through podcasts, you're taking programs, you're taking courses, and then you're going to potentially shut that off for a bit so that you can actually implement and learn by actually doing. Ideally, you can do both at the same time, but just being realistic with the amount of time that you have growing a business and potentially working another job, there just might be times where you are doing a lot of that mentorship and a lot of that growth, and then there's times where you're executing, and that's okay. Everything doesn't have to happen at the same time. I just really am a firm believer in seasons, and when it comes to balance, I feel like you can have it all, just not all at the same time. There's times in my life where I am working out more, I'm seeing friends and family more. On the flip side to that, there's times where I am hardcore execution mode and business mode and I just don't have time for that. So there's seasons of life and there's seasons of business as well. And when it comes to your mentors, one lesson I learned is that you actually want to seek out mentors that have the results you want. That is key. One of your friends or someone may tell you that this person's amazing, but at the end of the day, if you don't want what they have or you don't want what they've gotten their clients to do, don't work with them. And the other thing too is a lot of people like to give you advice, be it your parents and your friends, but if they don't have the life you want or they don't have the business you want, it's kind of just noise and you can politely ask them to stop or you can filter through it, but you want to make sure you're listening to seasoned professionals and not just listening to random people that like to give advice. And as you get more seasoned as an entrepreneur, you're going to start to realize what knowledge gaps you have. So if you know that right now, let's say for your marketing, you have a knowledge gap around how to repurpose content and you wanna figure out what that looks like, then seek out resources on that. 
As you start to get more seasoned, you start to realize where the gaps are, where you need to fill things in, what you're struggling with, and that can be a really good identifier as to what you need to work on. So at the beginning though, you definitely are gonna be drinking through the fire hose, and I like to say it's like a video game. If you don't have the skill you need to to get to the next level, you won't get there, so you really need to try to meet with people, talk to people, get mentors to really figure out what's missing to help you get there. But as you become more seasoned, you should be able to kind of do that yourself and you can almost coach yourself in a way. So don't be afraid of just trusting your gut, trusting your intuition as you become more seasoned. And as I promised, I am saving the best for last. So the last two lessons are lessons I learned the hard way. If you listen to the Recloseted Radio podcast, in episode 148, I talk about my $10,000 mistake. I'm going to leave the episode link down below. But essentially, I hired a PR agency. I gave them 10 grand to do PR for me. And long story short, it was an absolute disaster. Before I started working with them, in my gut, I kind of knew they weren't the right fit, but I decided to move forward anyways. And I think a lot of the times, if you feel like in your gut something's not going to work, but you can't explain it, I really do feel like you shouldn't ignore it. So that was the first thing I learned. I really learned that you need to trust yourself, really trust your instincts. And then when things started going awry and when things started happening, I'm not gonna detail it in this video because I went in depth in the podcast episode, but basically when they started slipping up, when they started making mistakes, I kept making excuses for them where I, I should have given that communication and that feedback right away and I probably should have fired them from the get-go instead of letting it go to kind of the extreme end, which I talk about in the podcast. but. Basically, really, I learned to communicate. I really learned to give feedback. I talked about that a little bit in the team section as well, but I essentially fired them, tried to get a refund, and the refund process taught me a lot. They held really, really firm, even though we just started working together, and I realized that I was in the shoes of a disgruntled customer, and I learned through that process how to treat people, and I learned how I would want someone that might not be happy with my business to feel. And so a lot of hard lessons learned here, but just around like hearing people out, making sure you genuinely apologize to people, make them feel seen and heard, dealing with this in a timely manner, not gaslighting people, and you know, just like being a decent human being. I just learned a lot through that. And if I went in depth on this, it would probably be another 20 minutes added to this video. So check out the podcast episode if you want to hear all the tea. But essentially it was a very costly mistake and I just don't want you to have to go through that. And so with that being said, that is 50 lessons I learned over the past five years in business. I hope that this was helpful for you. I hope that there's a lot of takeaways and tidbits you can get from this. If you have any questions, please leave them in the comments down below. I would love to chat with you. Let me know which lesson was your favorite or which lessons you learned the most from. And like I promised, if you made it until the end, that's amazing, I'm so happy, and I have an exclusive gift for you. I mentioned at the top of the video that I have a brand new masterclass. It is meant to help launch sustainable fashion brands and make a minimum of $20,000. And at that link, you're going to get the complete checklist from idea all the way to 20K launch about every single thing you need to do. I'm gonna walk you through the first few things so that you have your business foundation and your founder foundation ready. And then at the end, you will be able to book a complimentary 45 minute consultation with me so we can chat through your goals and really work through this. And usually I don't do one-on-one -on -one meetings, but there will be a limited amount. So it's going to be first come first serve. So make sure you book it before spots run out. I'm really excited to potentially meet you. And together, let's transform the harmful fashion industry.